It was a reign of terror that paralyzed half the country with fear. There was a horrible gloom over the north of England. A series of murders that were so brutal that they stunned the nation. There were stab wounds to the abdomen, but most significantly, there were two serious injuries to the back of the head with fractures of the skull. For it is known that a ball pane hammer similar to this one has been used in the initial attack in most of the killings. Despite the largest and most costly police operation the country had ever seen, the killer remained on the loose. There was this feeling that no woman was safe. The murders committed by the Yorkshire Ripper were crimes that shook Britain. The peas on the keys in this truth. Easy here, and we're back with another video. Today, we're going to talk about one of the biggest serial killing sprees in English history, which led to one of the biggest police investigations and also led into an inquiry into the police for its lack of awareness towards the whole subject, one of the most notorious serial killers in history. The Yorkshire Ripper. Peter William Sutcliffe was born on June 2nd, 1946, Bingley in the West Riding of Yorkshire to a Catholic born family. According to his brother, his father was an abusive alcoholic who smashed a beer glass over top of Peter's head when he sat in his chair at the family Christmas dinner. Now, Peter left school at age 15 to begin to take on a lot, a lot of uh, meaningless jobs, including two times as a grave digger in, uh, in the 1960s. Foreshadowing. <laughs> But between 1971 and 1973, he did work at Baird Television Factory on a packaging line. In 1975, he took redundancy, which is basically voluntary resignation, and he used it to obtain his uh, HGV driver license, like kind of like a CDL in America. So he became a truck driver after that. A year later, he was dismissed from his job for stealing used tires. <laughs> Sutcliffe's personality kind of foreshadowed what he would already become because due to his previous shifts as a grave digger, his sense of humor was very dark, and very gloomy, and he developed a strange obsession with uh, voyeurism. Like, I had to look that word up. And basically, that's you have an obsession with watching other people perform sexual inter perform sexual acts basically he would spy on he would spy on sex workers all right so we're only going to go into the murders that Sutcliffe did because i was researching and all in all he attacked 23 women and i felt like that video that would make the video extremely long i don't want to make this video too long. but we're going to go to the first murder which is in october 30th of 1975 the first victim is a woman named wilma mccann wilma mccann she is a mother of four children between the ages of two and seven Sutcliffe struck her on the back of the head with a hammer and then proceeded to stab her once in the throat six times in the chest and nine times in the stomach the police had an inquiry of over over eleven thousand interviews and over 150 different officers and they still were not able to find a culprit for this murder. In January 1976, Emily Jackson is persuaded by her husband to go start taking clients doing sex work because they're 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 behind on bills. So she gets picked up by Sutcliffe. Where Sutcliffe proceeds to hit her in the head with a hammer, we see a theme and proceeds to stab her with a rusty screwdriver 52 times. He also stomped on her thigh, which left a boot print on her thigh. 1977 is a very active year for Mr. Sutcliffe. Four murders in total this year. First one was on February 5th, 1977. Irene Richardson, he's hitting the head with a hammer, uses a knife to, you know, finish the course. This, the hammer is, is a theme. I don't know what the significance of the hammer is, but it's, it's definitely a theme in the story. Uh, April 23rd, 1977, Patricia Anderson in the back of the head with a hammer. Lee kills her in her apartment and also leaves a boot print on the bed sheet. So, you know, it's, he's, he's, he's not covering his tracks very well. June 26, 
1977. He kills a 16-year-old girl by the name of Jane McDonald. And this 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 particular this particular one, it raises a whole lot of questions because this is not this is not a girl who was into that lane. She was not doing sex work. She was not doing that stuff. So now is oh now all women are are potential victims of this guy. Like it's not just sex workers. It's all just women in general. October first, nineteen seventy seven. This is the fourth murder of this year so far. But Sutcliffe is starting to get a little sloppy. He kills Gene Jordan. And he, he realizes that he left a five pound note in one of her purses that could, that could trace him back to the crime. So after he hosts a family function at his house, he then leaves the family function and then goes back to where he killed Jordan and then tries to find the five pound note, which he doesn't find the five pound note. And he just slices her, he takes a knife, mutilates it, mutilates her, and just moves it, moves the corpse somewhere. Eight days later, her body is found. And the five-pound note is found in a secret compartment in her handbag. The craziest thing, over the next five months, the police conducted over 3,000 interviews, including Sutcliffe, but they, they couldn't find the culprit. After the, the five-pound note was found, they traced it back to the banks, the banks that were in the area. Over the next three months, the police interviewed over 5,000 men they felt were in possession of that five pound note, including Sutcliffe, but nothing came up. Photo fits made from descriptions of women who had been attacked were circulated in the Leeds and Bradford area. Despite this, the police investigation floundered. You always hoped that the next door you knocked upon, you would find the suspect and the case would be solved. I don't think anybody in the early days anticipated how it would snowball into such a major inquiry. I don't think anybody could have done. January 1978, the next victim, 21-year-old Yvonne Pearson, which is stereotypical, back in the head with a hammer. And for some reason, he stuffs horse hair in her mouth before he dumps her body near Lamb's Lane. 10 days later, Helen Ritka, the next victim, struck her in the head with the hammer, obviously. I mean, that's just the, 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 the preferred weapon of choice. Struck her in the head five times with the hammer before stripping her down and stabbing her multiple times in the chest. Her body was actually found three days later. In 1981, when, when he spoke to this, when he spoke, he was speaking to police after he got caught later. But about this particular murder, he said, I had the urge to kill anyone. The urge inside me to kill girls was now practically uncontrollable. May 16th, next victim, Vera Millward, in a car park on Manchester Road Infirmary. This is how many how many victims is this? I haven't even I haven't even kept track. 1979, April 4th, another victim, 19 year old Josephine Walker. This is where the case trying to kind of gets a little iffy because the police are given a cassette tape of a man who's supposedly the guy who's been who's been killing all these women. So I actually have footage of the tape. I'm going to play that now. I'm Jack. I see you are still having no look catching me. I have the greatest respect for you, George. But Lord, you are no near look catching me now. And four years ago when I started, I reckon your boys are letting you down, George. They can't be much good, can they? The only time they came near catching me was a few months back in Chapel Town, when I was disturbed. I warned you in March that I'd strike again. Sorry it wasn't Bradford. I'm not quite sure when I'll strike again. But it will be definitely sometime this year. I'm not sure where. Maybe Manchester. I like it there. There's plenty of them knocking about. They never learn, do they, George? I bet you've warned them, but they never listen. Well, it's been nice chatting to you, George. Yours, Chuck the River. And, and based on based on the accent in this tape, they searched for a guy who was from like from 
what do you say? What do you call it? where? Like I said, I'm not from I'm not from England, so I don't really know us from where side. Later on, you find out that this was a whole hoax, and this was just a guy who was just pretending to be the the, the ripper, even though he really wasn't. While while that guy was distracting the police, Sutcliffe claimed another victim, 20 year old Barbara Leach. This one act, again raised public attention that she was not a sex worker, even though the police interviewed. Sutcliffe, he had a clear alibi. There was no, there, there was no paper trail. There was no fingerprints. There was no path to detect him. The, the police interviewed Sutcliffe nine times in total before he got caught. Nine times. 1980, this is where Sutcliffe finally slips up. He gets arrested for drunk driving. But the crazy thing, while he awaited trial, he claims two more victims. Marguerite Walls and Jacqueline Hall. 13 total women. January 2nd, 1981, Sutcliffe is stopped with another potential victim in his car, 24-year-old Olivia Rivers, and they find out that he has false plates. They bring him in for questioning, and he matches a lot of the physical characteristics of the guy that they're trying to describe as the Yorkshire Ripper. The police actually returned to the scene where they arrested him. They found a knife, famous murder weapon, the hammer, and a rope. After two days of questioning on January 4th, 1981, Peter Sutcliffe Finally admits that he's the Yorkshire Ripper, just out of the blue. Then he just calmly goes about his attacks. Maybe if, if I have a video of his confession, I'll pull it up. But if not, I'll just read it off. So if, if, if it goes to the video, just know I, I found the video while I was editing. But if not, I'll just read the statement. These women that I killed were filth. Bastard prostitutes who were littering the streets. I was just cleaning up the place a bit. So while saying all this, the only form of regret that he had was for, for Jane McDonald, which was the youngest victim that he, that he had. We go to the trial. Sutcliffe pleads not guilty to 13 counts of murder. He also tries to plead diminished responsibility, which is, oh, you were held against your will and this, this is, you weren't responsible because you were told or you were forced. Basically, basically he said that he was doing God's will. And even his lawyers tried to plead that he had schizophrenia. He was, he was schizophrenic. He was paranoid. The judge denied all of that. They gave Sutcliffe 20 concurrent life sentences. 20 life sentences. 20. Guilty on all counts. 20 life sentences, concurrent. You're not going home, sir. However, after this case, the, the public was really angry at the police because the way they handled it, because the way that the police gathered information was a very, um, the, the way that they gathered information was very dated, very antiquated. They used handwritten index cards. <laughs> they used handwritten index cards to write down all their information about every suspect. Obviously, this was before computers, but bro, <laughs> index card. Not only did they have to reinforce the floors in the room where they stored the paper because it was so much paper and the filing cabinets were so heavy. It was just challenges of cross-referencing because you got to think about it. They had to really write down all of these clues and store them somewhere. So it's already a whole bunch of manual labor trying to write it down. And now you got to find where you wrote it down. And you got to make sure you organize stuff correctly. And you, like, that was basically the reason why Sutcliffe was able to get interviewed by the police nine times before he slipped up and got caught. They, the police were, were not close to finding him. He got caught. He slipped up and got arrested for drunk driving. And that's when the police were able to find him. But really what this event symbolizes was the uh, misogynistic and the sexist like attitudes of that era because I'm going to to read this statement. I might have a video. If I don't have a video, you just you just hear me read this thing. This was what the attorney general at the time of the trial, Michael Haver, said in 1981. He said, this is him talking about the victims, all the victims. Of some, of, some were prostitutes, but perhaps the saddest part of the case is that some were not. The last six attacks 
were all totally respectable women. <laughs> wow. That was the attitude. Like they, they, didn't, they didn't do prostitutes as real women back then. So now that Sutcliffe is in jail serving eternity, I'm going to run through a timeline of all the events that happened in his time in jail. Before we start, he did try to get sent to a psychiatric ward. The judge straight denied that. January 10th, 1983, he gets stabbed in the face by another inmate with a broken coffee jar requiring 30 stitches, big gashes, 30 stitches. July 1994, divorce, his wife divorces him. February 23rd, 1996, is attacked again. He almost gets strangled with the cords from a pair of headphones. Uh, March 10th, 1997, attacked for the third time, loses all his vision in the left eye. His right eye is permanently damaged. 2004, Sutcliffe's Father passes away, and he is allowed to actually go to the funeral, which does make public television. January 14th, 2011, his appeal is rejected. The life sentences still hold. And recently, November 13th of 2020, he did pass away from com- complications with from COVID. He also was rumored to have diabetes and other health, health defects that led to his death. Mr. Uh, Peter Sutcliffe. The Yorkshire Ripper. Again, RIP to the 13 women that lost their lives. That's a ridiculous story, man. The fact that he was able to go undetected for 10 years, because his first incident of his first attack was back in 1969. He didn't get caught until 1981. So 12 years, over a decade, he was able to he was able to run around and attack women, assault. And murder women and people and people and back then people didn't care because they were they were sex workers they weren't they weren't real women they weren't they weren't true respectable women it doesn't matter what happens to them like bro that's that's a terrible way to think but that was the 80s man but 70s and 80s that was that time but anyway thank you again for watching hope you enjoyed this um definitely be sure to leave some more comments of who you think i should do next because i'm thinking about doing one on stalin or joseph stalin or pol pot um leopold i don't know if i could do hitler i don't know because that, that's a bomb word on youtube but anyway thank you again please be safe hit that subscribe button if you're new to the channel so don't forget to turn on my post notifications please be safe have a great day in the grind i'm out Peace.